And so before we talk about the current state of the movement, Norm Phelps is going to be giving us an interesting history of our movement. Norm is the author of several books, including The Longest Struggle, Animal Advocacy from Pythagoras to PETA. I've read it, and it's the definitive book on the history of our movement. He's also a founding member of the Society of Ethical and Religious Vegetarians and a regular contributor to Dharma Voices for Animals. His newest essay will appear in the forthcoming anthology, Earth, Animal, and Disability Liberation, The Rise of Ecoability. Uh, like I said, he's going to give us a history of our movement, and I'm sure it's going to be extremely enlightening. So welcome Norm Phelps, everyone. Thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate those kind words. There is nothing in history that is absolutely new. Every idea, every movement, has antecedents. The immediate antecedents of the modern animal rights movement were the human rights movements of the 1960s. Primarily civil rights and second wave feminism. Animal rights did not evolve from the earlier animal welfare movements, which grew out of the religiously oriented Protestant reform movements of the 18th and 19th centuries. They grew out of the human rights movements that derived from the secular, rationalistic political philosophies of the Enlightenment. Animal rights is the orphan child of the 1960s. If I had to name a specific time and place for the birth of the American animal rights movement, I would give you October 10th, 1965, in London, England. On that date, Bridget Brophy, a British playwright, novelist, anti-war activist, an advocate for women's and gay and lesbian rights, published a full-page op-ed in the Sunday Times, pointedly titled, The Rights of Animals, in reference to Tom Paine's The Rights of Man, Brophy's essay argued that animals like human beings are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At first, the article appeared to have fallen into a bottomless pit and animal rights along with it. But toward the end of the 1960s, a small group made up mostly of postdoctoral students at Oxford University in England, including, incidentally, Australian philosopher Peter Singer, began getting together to discuss the ethical implications of our dominion over animals. Encouraged by Brophy, they were soon holding demonstrations protesting hunting, trapping, and vivisection, and issuing calls for people to adopt a compassionate vegetarian diet. In 1971, three members of this so-called Oxford group, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Stanley and Rosalind Godlevich and John Harris, edited the first book produced by the modern animal rights movement, an anthology entitled Animals, Men, and Morals. Then came 1975. Three things happened in 1975 that made it the most remarkable year yet in the history of the American animal rights movement. First, Peter Singer published the book that would galvanize a generation into action. I know of almost no one who came to animal rights between 1975 and 2000 who does not describe reading animal liberation for the first time as something akin to a religious conversion. And that includes me. Second, a New York high school teacher began planning the first campaign of the modern American animal rights movement. The year before that, Henry Spira had taken a continuing education class 
on animal liberation that was being taught at City College in New York by Peter Singer, who was there as a visiting professor that year. And so, being a former union organizer and civil rights campaigner, Spira organized a campaign to shut down a laboratory run by the American Museum of Natural History. The researchers there were mutilating cats to learn the effect of brain damage on their sex lives. Spiro launched his campaign in June 76, and after 18 months of picketing, leafleting, letters to the editor, petitions to Congress, and museum boycotts, the laboratory lost its federal funding, and the museum shut it down. <clears throat> The first campaign in the history of the American animal rights movement was a resounding success. The third critical element of 1975 was the biennial conference of the International Vegetarian Union, which was held in North America for the first time that year on the campus of the University of Maine at Orono. For several years, there had been lone voices crying in the wilderness like pioneering Brooklyn eco-feminist Connie Salamone, who first linked together in one matrix the oppression of animals, women, and workers. But the Orono Conference brought these forerunners and pioneers into contact with one another, and into contact with vegetarian and animal activists from all over the world. This generated a synergy that soon led to the creation of a coherent national American animal rights movement. The next milestone came in 1980 when Ingrid Newkirk and Alex Pacheco, inspired by Singer's Animal Liberation, founded a local animal rights group in Washington, D.C that they called People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. The following year, 1981, Pacheco went undercover at a vivisection lab in nearby Silver Spring, Maryland, the Institute for Behavioral Research, and came away with damning evidence of horrible abuse of the 17 monkeys who were imprisoned there. Peter turned the evidence Pacheco had gathered over to the Maryland State's Attorney's Office. The Montgomery County Police raided IBR, seized the monkeys. The state prosecuted Edward Taub, IBR's owner and lead researcher, for over 100 counts of animal cruelty, the first time an American researcher <laughs> had ever been charged with a violation of animal cruelty laws. Taub was ultimately cleared of all charges, except one, and that was dismissed on a technicality. Essentially, he got off scot-free. But the national media had covered the raid on IBR, and to the extent that anything could go viral in an era with no YouTube, no Facebook, and no Twitter, the Silver Spring Monkeys went viral with a vengeance. <clears throat> Overnight, PETA became a household word, and the process of establishing animal rights in the public consciousness that had been begun by Peter Singer and Henry Spira was substantially complete in the wake of the Silver Spring Monkeys. From the mid-70s through the early 90s, animal rights groups and campaigns proliferated across the country as groups like Farm, United Poultry Concerns, and Farm Sanctuary gradually shifted the movement's primary focus from vivisection to animal agriculture, which accounts for well over 95% of the animals murdered in America. This was a period, a 
of intellectual ferment, intense campaign activity, and the permanent insertion of animal rights into the American social justice dialogue. But by the middle of the 1990s, a deep anxiety had settled over the movement. After 20 years of high octane advocacy, there was no measurable progress toward animal liberation. In fact, more animals were murdered in America in 1995 than had been in 1975. In 1990, a national march on Washington patterned after Dr. Martin Luther King's 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom drew 24,000 participants to the National Mall. Six years later, in 1996, a similar march drew fewer than 4,000. The drop-off in attendance reflected a growing belief that the environmental tactics we'd borrowed from the civil rights and feminist movements of the 60s, marches, demos, picketing, uh, civil disobedience, and so forth, had failed us. And it was time for new strategies better suited to the world of the 1990s. This search produced two different answers, which in turn produced a movement divided into two wings. One wing, styling itself abolitionist, argued that the entire animal rights movement must pursue vegan advocacy and only vegan advocacy. We must all, according to this view, argue our pure moral position and nothing but our pure moral position. So-called single issue campaigns and welfare reforms must be avoided, first because they are a betrayal of the moral baseline, veganism, and secondly, because they retard the cause of animal liberation by undermining the vegan abolitionist message. The other wing, which has never bothered to name itself, but was styled new welfareists by the abolitionists, believed that in addition to vegan advocacy, the movement must seek out new ways to move a deeply recalcitrant public toward animal liberation. One partial, incremental step at a time. This group focused on initiatives to reduce the consumption of animal products, such as encouraging various forms of flexitarianism, and uh, focused also on, <coughs> excuse me, welfare reform measures, such as bans on gestation crates for pigs and battery cages for laying hens, viewing these as valuable tools in the campaign for animal rights. And they saw a strategy of simply repeating the pure vegan message over and over as an exercise in futility. In 2004, Wayne Pacelli became president and CEO of the staid, conservative, old, humane society of the United States. The biggest animal welfare, read dog and cat, organization in the world. In 2005, Pacelli merged HSUS with the more aggressive Fund for Animals, and shortly thereafter with the Doris Day Animal League, which was noted for its sophisticated lobbying machine. The result was a rejuvenated organization that was aggressive in pursuing initiatives for reducing the consumption of animal products and easing the suffering of animals on factory farms. With its large membership and budget, the new HSUS quickly became a major force in the moderate wing of the animal rights movement. Abolitionists, such as Rutgers law professor Gary Francione, 
filmmakers James Levesque and Jenny Stein, and others, responded to this development by arguing that HSUS and its allies were undermining the efforts of activists who were delivering a pure vegan message. With that, we have left the realm of history and entered the world of current affairs. As we come together here tonight, victory is still far over the horizon. But all things considered, animal rights has made remarkable progress since a left-wing feminist playwright <laughs> first made readers of the Sunday Times gag on their English breakfasts of sausages and eggs with an article demanding social justice for animals. Best of all, we are beginning to see harbingers of solid, quantifiable success. American meat consumption in 2012 is estimated by meat industry analysts to be 12.2% lower than it was in 2007. This, <laughs> yes. this is the first time in history outside of wartime when there was rationing that American meat consumption has trended downward. There is a lot that, as animal rights activists, we encounter that can, that can break your heart. But there is a lot to feel good about, too. And there is one hell of a lot more to look forward to. Thank you, one and all. Thank you.